Well, welcome to the May meeting of Lower Makefield Farmland Preservation Incorporated. I'm Michael Blank. I'm the uh, president of the organization, all volunteers, of course. And uh, joining me tonight are Dennis Stedman, who's a vice president and acting uh, secretary. Also, Dan Bonkowski, who is our treasurer. And Sean Carney, our newest member. Welcome, everyone. Thanks. So, so we'll, I'll turn it over to, to Dennis for the first agenda item, which is approval of the minutes of, from yeah, April. The, uh, the meeting, uh, I'm sorry, the minutes from the April 15th uh, meeting were circulated. Uh, I've not heard any comments. Are there any comments, uh, corrections, additions uh, to the minutes? Hearing, no. hearing none, I would make a motion that they uh, be approved as drafted. Second. Second. Would so, Sean seconds. All in favor, say aye. Raise your hand. Aye. 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 Uh, the minutes are so approved. So we'll move right along to the treasurer's report, the next agenda item. That's uh, for Dan, Dan Bankowski. Um. So since we last spoke, we, uh, we sent payment to Corcoran Landscaping for $5,000 for the work that he did on the Leadhams property. We also got the invoice for $6,000 for the work on the Stackhouse property. It hasn't been mailed to him yet, but it's, it's sitting there in an envelope. And then also um, uh, another check for him for $400 for the bamboo work at Makefield Brook. And so that check has been mailed out yet, but it's sitting in an envelope just to be mailed out then too. And that is it. Dan, just a procedural question. So since we have the ability to, uh, to do bill pay, I think we, we do, do not through Fidelity. We do not. Have uh, as a business, as a, as a business yeah. account, the they don't Corporate accounts it. don't have bill pay set up the same way. All right. So for record keeping, I guess it works out better anyway. Good. Uh, it is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> but it's odd because we were able to deposit checks by the yeah. app and all. So, okay. All right. Uh, if there's nothing else on that topic, we'll move to the next one. And that is process for interviewing prospective board members. Uh, Sean, do you want to start that? And if James is able to join us, we can ask him any questions we want at that point. Sure, I'm happy to. Obviously, uh, a conversation with James would um, would be welcome because I'm sure he can give us or at least myself some insights that that perhaps I'm not privy to. But I just think that in all situations, there's something to be learned. And in the past couple of months, um, you know, we've had two board members join myself um, and and a board member that was here for a couple of months and the incoming process was different. And I think that, you know, I don't know if there's an exit interview or, or, or what there is, uh, quite honestly, for a voluntary board, but I just think there's things to be learned. And my request or question would be uh, what we can do on the vetting side on the way in. So to perhaps alleviate what could become a revolving door. I don't view this voluntary board as um, just any typical board. There's a, a decent amount that goes into what we're doing on a, on a monthly basis. There are a decent amount of hours that get put in. There's a decent amount of dedication. And, um, and, and I think that being able to go onto a website and simply click on and become a, a board member, you know, perhaps may not be doing ourselves a service or, you know, others, others that come in. So just trying to think out loud about how maybe in the future we can alleviate some of that and whether it's by, you know, some type of a vetting process. I think about my experience where, uh, Mike, you contacted me. I took some time to talk to, to Dan because I had met with Dan. I took some time to meet with you. I got to know the scope of the ask and was able to commit to that. So if I can't fulfill that, then shame on me. But had I come in blind, I may have been, you know, eyes wide open that, oh my goodness, I can't believe, you know, there's this much involved in it type of thing. So just wanting to learn from the process. Um, that's all. And, um, you know, take any direction for, you know, that, that can be given to us, but 
just I just think that this board should be given somewhat of a heads up that someone has applied and be able to at least speak with them about the commitment uh, before um, just, you know, finding out that they're, you know, they've been approved. What I'd like to do is go around and find out what each of our experiences was with the board of supervisors. I'm going to start just by saying that I was asked one or two questions. What was my interest? Why did I want to join this board? Um, and I think they had my resume in front of them. And, and that was the end of it. It was very, I would call it haphazard, but it was random, a random, whatever the, a board of supervisor wanted, to, uh, a member of the board would wanted to ask me. How, how, what was your experience, Sean? Similar. Um, living, breathing exercise. I was a I was there uh, to answer any any questions that they had. They had seen what I had sent them, which was, to your point, a resume, uh, just a, you know, a crafted resume about what fit with this role, um, not a you know, not a business summary. Um, answered any questions they had, but I never felt like it was really an, an approval process. I had gone through the steps to get to them, um, and it was just kind of more of a blessing that yes, this this works for you. Um, that was at least my interpretation of it. And, and Dan had it, what was yours? Uh, well, I, I guess I just want to back up a sec because um, you you know, for Sean, you were, I think, not a normal setup, right? Mm -hmm. Because um, we met you and had, we had similar interests and you were very interested in what was happening. And so we asked you, right? Yeah. versus other people that are see an opening and reach out to the township because the general process is that the township supervisors have the ability to appoint people to our board, not us, the directors sitting on the board right now, the township supervisors appoint. So, um, but I, similar experience of what you, what you both had to say. And I, but I think, where we're going to cut to the chase, right, is that the supervisors or township manager need to insert, uh, you know, insert a line break here. That is, um, somebody is sends an email to the township and is interested. That needs to be forwarded over to Mike before it's sent to the township. Before the supervisors see that resume and start having questions, I think it needs to go to us first to reach out to the person and have a conversation with the person, that seems like a much more logical approach. Agreed. Yeah, Dennis? Yeah, I mean, I, I joined a couple of years ago, uh, so it's reasonably uh, fresh. Uh, yeah, I, I had expressed interest to the Board of Supervisors for a different committee uh, uh, back in, in 2019. And uh, upon my resume and, and interview, uh, they realized I had an agricultural background uh, in, in a career in agriculture. So they said, well, you know, they suggested the farmland. I had no idea <laughs> what farmland preservation did or what was involved. Uh, I found that out by attending my first few monthly meetings and getting to know the board members and the issues and. You know, uh, and I've, I've enjoyed it. There's no no regrets. I, I but I did kind of back into it. I would say uh, I, I I agree with uh, uh, with what Dan is saying. Uh, uh, just a, just a couple statements. One, the the assignment of the board members is 100% up to the board of supervisors. There's no question. It's their call. It's their call. Pro con anything else. Uh, I, I, my suggestion is that the, these uh, that the current farmland preservation committee board does not have a say in who is joining the board. Uh, it is the board of supervisors' responsibility, and I think that's pro a proper structure. But to Dan's point, I think if someone expressed interest, uh, it would be appropriate for the uh, board of supervisors to direct that person. To you, Mike, or or any other board member, and strictly for that person's education and information purposes, to say, why don't you go talk to uh, the farmland board, learn what 
they're doing, learn what's involved, learn what the commitment is. And in armed with that information, if you're still interested, come back and we'll consider your candidacy. It is still their their call. But I think the, the better uh, the, the step of educating that candidate, that prospective uh, board member in front of their approval would it just makes good common sense. Uh, so it's not a question of this board picking its uh, its its colleagues, but it's just informing uh, an educational step in that in that interviewing process by the board of supervisors is what I would would, would recommend. And, yeah, uh, and I, I oh, sorry. No, no, I'm I'm. I'm I think that's perfectly what, what your suggestion is perfectly legitimate. And that was one running through my mind too, is that we just put in a request. We can do that through our liaison now, James, that we are enabled to speak to any prospective board members before they, before they vote. If they choose not to do that, that's their prerogative. Mm -hmm. We can certainly, we can request that. And I think it will be accepted. And, and I think it's uh, it, it's for the, the the candidates' benefit. So they're they're coming into assignments and responsibilities eyes wide open, uh, and and they're not volunteering for something without knowing what they're signing up for. Uh, Eight thirty on a Saturday morning or something. Uh, you know, sometimes it's a fit, sometimes it isn't, and uh, and so that educational step I think is important. And. Each board, as this board goes through time, can do as much or as little as it chooses. Right. Uh, you know, it depends on the personalities involved. And I think we have a, an active board, and I like that. And mm -hmm. so the people that join us should be prepared to be uh, more active than maybe they anticipated. <laughs> I agree. Good. I would think that the Board of Supervisors would be welcoming to the thought of ultimately interviewing candidates that have an understanding of the role, the scope of the role, and will fulfill a, a four-year commitment to the role, as opposed to having to do this again in six months, you know, whatever it may be. Great, great. All right, so I'll, I'll uh, take that as an action for me to speak with uh, James as okay. our liaison. And if you think that it would be important for us to, uh, for me to speak to Susan, Suzanne Blundy as the current um, head, I could do that too. I think township manager. Ah, okay. And, 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 and take James's lead on that. Uh, he should have mm. a pretty good lead on mm -hmm. how to, you know, best uh, implement that kind of that kind of process. Because the applicants go through the township manager and he or she then forwards it on to the board of supervisors. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, definitely we'll, uh, we'll do that. Okay. I'll speak to both of them or get James guidance on, on, on approaching the township manager. He does that or I do that. Good. All right. Very good. Anything else on that topic? Kirk, any, any, any comments from the public? No public comment. Okay, thanks. We can move on now to the next topic, update on honey beekeeping uh, from Dennis. Yes, okay. Um, well, uh, we've, uh, I think, cleared uh, all, all the hurdles. We've had the necessary public meetings. Uh, and uh, the we have a three-year lease with uh, Dr. Sven Strand, uh, that begins May 1st. Uh, I sent him that that lease after uh, everyone's reviewed it. He has signed that lease and it's on the way to you, Mike. If you don't have it yet, it, it was sent by US postage to you for counter signature along with his first rent check uh, is coming. Uh, De Dennis, just clarify, that was sent to the township first and then they will forward it to me. I uh, think, it's, right? It's addressed to you with, at the township building address. That'll take some time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. Just uh, so we know. 
at the same on the same uh, time, I sent the side letter agreement to Charlene Farms for Sam Stewart to sign. Uh, that releases him of any responsibilities for that uh, that plot that has the bees, which we have uh, subsequently leased to Sven. Uh, I've, I've not had, I've not heard back from him. I know he had no objections to it. Um, it's a busy time of year. I just sent him a follow-up email to ask where that agreement is, but uh, I don't, I, I don't know or see any issues uh, there. Uh, the uh, the honeybee uh, uh, the hives will go uh, the bee the hives and the bees will go into uh, location on uh, this weekend. Uh, if I could uh, share my screen uh, quickly, sure. This to show you. Uh, if Got it. See that those are the the two hives that uh, Sven has developed. Uh, very professional, very colorful, very cute. Uh, he he had a stencil made and he did all the painting and stenciling uh, himself. Um, mm. I think uh, they will uh, they will look quite uh, quite nice in the woods and be quite clear as to what they are to. Uh, to anyone that should run across them, uh, that shouldn't be anyone since they're uh, it's a, it's no trespassing. But uh, yeah. you know, we'll take that uh, we'll, we'll we'll take that as as we need to. Uh, the uh, the issue uh, that Mike raised last time about uh, his liability insurance coverage, uh, he he has expanded his on um, his umbrella liability coverage on his homeowners. Uh, you know, the, the his insurance company and, and no insurance company would put into writing uh, exactly what would be covered by an umbrella and liability coverage. They won't put into writing. We'll cover your beehives on the adjacent property. Uh, but he has talked to his agent, and he and I and the agent have shared several emails back and forth with our interpretations of the policy. Um, and the agent has agreed with our interpretations, which uh, by our lay read, layman's read, uh, means that yes, it would be covered. It's at least uh, property adjacent to his residence that he uses for a hobby. So I, I don't. Uh, we're we're comfortable at this point that there's no there's no uh, uh, liability issue there. Uh, now, if I could. Oh, stop share. Sorry, <laughs> I was trying to figure out how to uh, stop sharing. So that's that's the beehives. They'll go in this weekend, um, and we wish him a lot of luck. It takes a lot of work to get uh, two colonies established uh, with two queens and, and X pounds of of worker bees. But uh, uh, we're hoping for uh, for much success. Absolutely. Did Dennis, two things real quick. One, if you stop by at all, uh, I'd love to. Um, I'd love to tag along. Uh, I, I find mm -hmm. it. I find it fascinating. Um, the boxes you showed are two box systems. But if the colonies begin to produce, did he say those could ultimately become four and five box systems? Yeah, I. And, and I. The, the only thing I know about the actual production of this is what Stan has shared with me. So I'm, I'm far from an expert. But there, there are uh, uh, wooden frames in each one of those boxes. Uh, Got it. And so he will build up the frames uh, in the in in those uh, boxes that you see. I think he'll start with one box with one or two frames, mm -hmm. and then he'll he'll build the boxes and the frames as the colony requires. Got it. But yeah, I, I, I'm anxious to to see it too. Great, thank you. I'm, I'm going out of town this weekend for the next week, so uh, I'm not going to be there when he uh, is doing the work to establish him, but uh, I have a feeling he probably needs to do that on his own anyway. Sure. <laughs> and Dennis, uh, to your point about, you know, the, the work involved, uh, how often, do you know how often he has to go out there and kind of uh, work with them? Yeah, he, 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 uh, 
under normal circumstances, barring something unusual, he said he would he would probably be out there once a week tending the, the hives. Um, but in the early days, I'm sure it would be more frequent than that, you know, checking on on uh, on the food. He supplements them with some food and, and water, particularly in the early days. So uh, probably more often in the beginning. Good. And kudos to you again, Dennis, because you know that, that, that we've really gotten some good uh, PR out of this. Uh, Suzanne uh, Blundy um, at the Board of Supervisors said, oh, what about uh, the farmland preservation and the bee, honeybee keeping that they're doing? Isn't that a good, good, good thing for the township? So great. Yeah. yeah. yeah I'm glad. Okay. Um, okay. So now we're going to turn to some updates on parcel issues. And uh, we're going to start with Sean on Stackhouse and uh, Mr. Kaplan's property, the bean, the old bean farm. Mm -hmm. Mike, just wrote before I jump in, do you want to see if there's any public comment on the honeybee keeping? Oh, thank you. Thanks for the reminder. Kirk, any public comment on honeybees? There is no public comment. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sure. All right. So take, take it away. Yep. So Stackhouse and Bean, Bean Farm. So obviously we did the, uh, the, the cleanup work to the buffer area of Stackhouse and, um, you know, day six was ultimately spent on a, a slightly different project. So uh, Corcoran Landscaping had alerted us uh, about a month ago to um, a decent amount of brush that was piling up on the south end of 1561 Dolington, which is uh, Bean Farm, Mr. Kaplan's property. So I had gone out to look at it. And there was fresh cut wood that was being piled up. Mike came out and looked at it. Um, so ultimately what we did was I got together with Mr. Kaplan and walked the property line with him. And, you know, it seems like, you know, almost no harm, no foul. It seems like over the years, things have happened to the point where some of our branches or trees have come down. They've been cut up and left there. We've removed, we, we have removed a few trees prior to myself being on the board, familiar with it. Uh, it does look like there was some dumping that may have gone on there. And it looks like maybe the landscapers there had also been contributing to it. So we kind of, you know, put a, an end to it in this sense. We had Matt Corcoran while he was there clean up that fence line as part of his project. And I documented it through pictures and videos I spoke with Mr. Kaplan and let him know we'd be putting in a no trespassing sign uh, as suggested. The far, uh, Mr. Kaplan had asked for maybe a gate or a, a, a chain link that went across to keep vehicles from pulling in there. Obviously, the farmers uh, did not want to see that happen because of their equipment and the angle they come into the property. So what we did was we, we put a sign up, no trespassing, uh, under surveillance. Uh, anyone caught trespassing will be prosecuted. That sign is put in. Uh, game cam will be there on and off uh, to monitor the area. But at the end of the day, the fence line is all cleaned up. And um, you know, I did remind Mr. Kaplan that you know, we did it at our expense and to please remind anyone that's doing work there uh, that nothing is to go over that fence line. And I'll keep them, you know, obviously, a closer eye on it. Uh, I'm over there quite often. So that has been taken care of. In the process of this, I, I did learn that the uh, subdivision of that property was sold. So now on the northern side of the property, that, that you know, flagstone-shaped piece of property was sold. It was supposed to close at the end of April, and a home will be going in there. Um, you know, as I, Dan has mentioned, in, in a good idea, probably a good idea for us to perhaps get in touch with um, the township for when the driveway goes in. The driveway is going to literally go right down the fence line, which as we know, the fence line and the property line do not match. And because we're having the, the conservation work done right below there, uh, which was obviously a water issue, a driveway is going to be built out of something non-permeable water. You're going to create you know, something. So probably just in our interest, um, just you know, worth kind of knowing when things will be done um, uh, and getting in touch with, with someone. I could use some advice on exactly who to get in touch with. If James were here, I'd, I'd ask him for his advice. But um, like I said, from the way I saw the, the property design, 
the driveway is going to go right down kind of the, you know, near the fence line to the back of the property. So again, stack house cleaned up, good project, spent an extra day, did some work that the farmers had pointed out that would be a great help for them with the size of their equipment, took care of that. A couple of neighbors had asked for a few things to be cleaned up. Their requests seemed minimal. A few neighbors had mentioned at their expense, they've actually worked on trees that had fallen from our property to theirs. So it seemed like a very even, uh, even and fair um, trade. And we got this project done at the same time. So um, you know, just an update, uh, an update there. Thanks, Sean. Uh, Dan, any comments on the property line, the driveway, and who Sean should contact? Is it Jim Majewski? That, that's that's who I was thinking as well. Okay, I'll do that, and uh, I'll ultimately just be inquiring for you know t- timing of of anything. Um, and just let him know of our interest as being the neighboring property and kind of the work that we're having done at a similar time uh, and the water issues that we've had, just making sure that, you know, that we, you know, have some details, that's all. Now, now we, we did get a um, review and a attestation to the fact that whatever was being done, well, we, we had, a, we had the, the water runoff plan or stormwater drainage, whatever they call it, for the Kaplan subdivision, looked at by Rachel Anuska of the mm-hmm. Soil of Buck County Conservation District. Uh, she said from looking at it that she didn't have a problem with it. Mm-hmm. So we got clear and some assurance there that it looks, it won't damage whatever, even with the driveway, uh, it wouldn't damage us. Yeah, I mean, and, and in theory, I hope that's right, and I'm, it, it probably right. is. But at the end of the day, you're going to throw in a non-permeable driveway from front to back. You're going to be removing several trees, and you're going to be yep. putting in a home. With and with a home comes a, an even larger non-permeable area right in that corner. So there are several factors going in all at the same time. Yeah, I, I, no argument there, and we should get confirmation again from Jim. Uh, absolutely, yeah. Well, I, I know that the township had to review that. The township already reviewed the plans around the permeable surface area for the for that property, for the subdivision, um, and which I, I agree that that is a concern that they shouldn't keep modifying it. You know, you have no idea what's going to happen when somebody actually finalizes their plans, right? Um, and then also I would certainly mention the other concern around the fence line that cause the, the homeowner or the purchaser should also know that because again, that was in all of the, I know there's stakes out there. I know that there are surveys that were already done. I'm sure plans and writings and drawings were all shared. So that shouldn't be a surprise to anybody at all whatsoever, but you know, we want to make sure once you get a contractor on site that they are, they're still following the same thing. So, so I would just, I would just mention in that email too, about the concern around the fence line versus the property line don't match up and. Got it. There's also, uh, I I don't, I don't know exactly, but I know there's setbacks from property lines and driveways. I mean, the driveway can't, be on the property line. There's a minimum setback. Yeah. Uh, and and we want to be sure that's adhered to. And then from the property line, farmland preservation, uh, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, uh, but we're obligated to provide a 25 foot buffer between our property line and the field, the, the cropping right. area. And so we'll want to be sure that we're Minding our P's and Q's and distances there, and maybe want some stakes in terms of where the property, the cropping area should be versus the property line. Because Tim's going to go out there and plant, you know, be, before all this is done, and uh, we 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 would like him to plant. Uh, what, uh, his planning is to be appropriate come this fall after all this construction is done, and, sure. and we all know that. Uh, different agencies will review the site plan 
and approve them. But when it comes to the actual construction and work, uh, well, the, elect the electrical inspection is very detailed. Sometimes the inspection on actual surface areas and property lines are not quite as closely monitored. And I think in this case, with preserved farmland beside this, we're going to want to be pretty diligent that those plans are, are adhered to along the way. Correct. Okay. Noted. Hey, uh, so, Dennis, uh, on, that, okay. on that, talking about the 25-foot buffer, is that a um, is that an ordinance or is that just in our lease? I no, I I thought that it was part of our uh, part of our operating agreement, uh, part of our uh, terms and conditions for for preserving the farmland. That it will be farmed, I, but there's a twenty five foot minimum buffer to be maintained between the cropping area and a residential property line. Now, I, I'm fairly certain that it's codified in a in a, in in the township ordinance. Okay. Yeah. I've seen that. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't quote the chapter and verse, and we should probably look at that, but uh, I think we're, we're obligated to maintain that distance. You can't crop right up to someone's, uh, up to our fence line. Uh, that's, that's good. Mike, that was outlined in the same document you sent me about the actual wording of what we can and cannot do with trees in the buffer that I passed on to Matt Corcoran as he was doing the work so that right. he was well aware of what he could and could not take down if a, if a neighbor asked. Good. Yep. And, and so just let me uh, summarize the three issues that you're going to contact Jim Majewski about, Sean, is like the storm water runoff, the property line, and the buffer area. And the yes. impact of the impact of the driveway and any tree removal on, on that. So, yes. Okay. And 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 then you know, even beyond the driveway, and, once the house is constructed and landscaping is done and trees and shrubbery and you know, sure. made beautiful, uh, again there, there needs to be some diligence that plans are adhered to. Yes. And there is there's a key component in there, and that's the pond that had, uh, according to that stormwater runoff plan, played a key role in in the water control in that in that building. So that's another thing that we'll hope that they would keep an eye on. The, I think in, in the final what's that? In the subdivision, the pond is part yeah. of the subdivision. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I, I forget what they call it, a rock pond, or there's some type of a pond there that was part of that. Okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, anything else on that, John? Oh. Nothing for me, just if anybody has anything else, that's all. Thanks for all your diligence on that, John. Good, good work. My, but my, there's, there's a lot of moving parts. <laughs> there are. There are. Something to dig your teeth into. That's good. Okay. Um, the next um, parcel is Farm View One and the drainage into the retention basin. Dan. So the good news is this is we're talking about Farm View One. So the south side of Woodside and Dollington, and take it down to the bottom of that hill where we have pooling that takes place on our property. And um, as you guys know, essentially the water should be drained off into the retention basin there. However, there's a bit of like a rock dam that, that was built up. And the good news is that the township is going to, it's not, you know, high up on the list or not scheduled quite yet, but the township's going to basically pull that apart there so that the water should drain off much quicker and easier so that they're gonna bring that, that level of that rock pile down. So hopefully it should work out well. Um, you know, Greg Hucklebridge is sure that it was on the list, um, but you know, didn't have a timing in place quite yet. Basically waiting for when, you know, other equipment is in the same vicinity really. Right. 
Right. That's great. So the township did uh, affirmatively agree to that. that yes. That's good news. Well, well done. Yeah, yeah so this should be good. It, it'll be exciting to see how this kind of plays out and how the bottom of that of that field looks then here in the future, too. Yeah, that's been a sore point for a long time. It's glad that you've taken care of it. Thanks, Dan. Okay, that's it for uh, buffer issues. Any public comment, Kent, on, uh, on that no section? public comment. Okay, thank you, Kurt. Um, all right, we'll move on to an, a, a proposed agreement with Corcoran Landscaping, uh, including bamboo. And Sean, if you could uh, take that and uh, Dan comment as needed. Okay, so months ago, I, I had made a suggestion that perhaps we um, start a contract with Corcoran Landscaping given the the multi-year plan that we were laying out and the priority of properties that we wanted to work on and so on. And while we agree in principle, there are a couple of things that have kind of slowed the process down that I want to discuss and come up with the best plan. And let's remember that the reason for doing this was to A, kind of set us on a schedule where we would know our payments almost ahead of time. So to set a ceiling on something we all agreed was going to be a greater portion of our, um, of our payout, uh, if you will, going forward, not uh, given the aging of the buffer areas. So Corcoran Landscaping made us an agreement that they would charge us a winter rate to do work, which was $1,000 a day, a summer rate to do work, which was $2,000 a day, and I've gone back and forth and the buffer work is ultimately $1,200 annually. That's three installments of taking care of the bamboo from cutting, spraying, um, and mitigating you know, it, it to come up and become a problem again. So uh, I looked into that. There isn't a way to do it two times a year, one time a year, four times is unnecessary. What we're currently doing is the most economic uh, in the short term and in the longer term. You do it less, you pay more down the road, you do it more, it's, it's useless. So the one issue that I keep running into is, you know, when we form a contract, I was trying to make it easier on Dan, for instance, where we make a quarterly payment to Corcoran Landscaping. And it just doesn't work for Matt in his business. He totally prefers to bill out after a job is done for several reasons, organization, cash flow reasons, so on. But then I got thinking, if we're just going to get billed after each and every job, is a contract really necessary? I have no indication that our day rate in the summer or winter is going to change. And I have no indication that our bamboo price is going to change either. I guess you know, the only thing that it still helps with is that we were purchasing days from Corcoran Landscaping instead of jobs, which was a benefit to us in the sense that if tonight there's a storm and a tree falls from the buffer area onto a property and we call Matt in the morning and say, can you go to X property and take care of it? When he was done, we weren't going to get a bill. He was going to send to me, Sean, I was there four hours. You have four hours left on that day type of thing. So there was a benefit to that. He's willing to be billed out uh, to, be, uh, to do this monthly, but that's about as far as he can go. So my question back to the board is this. We've talked about this ad nauseum. We have all the details we agree on everything in principle. Do we want to move forward and do this where we lock into 10 winter days, which for the next three years, we have the work for, no doubt, two summer days, which again, we have the work for. And then the buffer is a non-issue in that we're sticking with the buffer, that the, oh, I'm sorry, with the, with the bamboo, hey, the bamboo plan that we have, we're sticking with that going forward so that it doesn't become a bigger headache down the road. Do we want to go forward with that? And then, um, and if we do, do we want to be billed by job or do we want to do this on a monthly basis? We know what the annual fee will be. If we do this, we would just be paying one twelfth every month. 
you know, again, it was being done in the best interests of both parties. I think we got somewhere with it, but at the end of the day, do we want to sign a three-year contract uh, for this, or do we kind of just want to continue to use uh, corporate landscaping uh, when we need them and how we need them, but not go into a, a contract itself? Um, in the three-year agreement, are those prices fixed, the, the daily rates? They, the, the, they are fixed with a 2.5% increase annually on the summer jobs alone. Okay. So I did drop into our Teams folder the, um, the, the contract that I'm working on. So you'll be able to see it there. Uh, but the, so it, the summer rate and bamboo rate are frozen. The, the bamboo period. rate is frozen. The winter rate is frozen because he knows who his workers are in the wintertime. It's he, his son, and maybe one other. In the summertime, he has a couple variables, such as minimum wage changes, gasoline prices, and his workers. So he asked for a slight increase on the summer months. So we built in a 2.5% increase annually. And he was perfectly happy with that. So we know what the price is going into each year period. And we agreed it fully in principle. He just said he doesn't run a business where he can you know, receive a check quarterly when he owes guys out weekly. And I get that. I do understand. I mean, I, I think just locking in those the three-year price agreement makes the contract, in my mind, worthwhile. Now, you know, the, the billing situation, I think, you know, that's between, you know, kind of Dan and Cochran, what, what works, whether it's monthly or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that I see is less important, but walking in rates for a good reason to do a three-year agreement. And, and we can look at each other knowing we have this agreement. So when stuff happens, like stuff always happens, yeah, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're in it together a little more, right? It, it changes the relationship. Right. And again, it is at our cost. We know what it is. And that's great. And we're never going to waste because if let's say we have a great year and no trees come down in the summertime and Matt does no work for us in the summertime. Well, then we get him working on the projects we already know we're going to get working on. So we're never going to waste hours. Let's put it that way. Um, you know, but to Dan, you know, is it easier for you to receive invoices each time he does work? Or would you rather know each month we owe a check for X amount to corporate landscaping? I think it'll be easier to receive it per job as the work is done. The best benefit of that is, as you know, we're trying to improve our books and record keeping. And this will allow us then to, uh, he will be billing us by project. Therefore it's automatically allocated to the right farm and the right parcel mm -hmm. so that we don't need to go in after the fact and divvy it up ourselves. So, and, you know, sure. It's nice and easy not to have to, you know, write a bunch of checks for each job as they come through, but it doesn't make that much of a difference. And I think it, it'll just be easier than probably from a record keeping perspective to, you know, to attach it all to the right work. Yeah. Okay. And if that's his preference, you know, yeah. fine. Right. It is his preference. He was certainly willing to work with us by going to a, a month. Um, but it was his preference to do it by job. The only time that it won't be a hundred percent clean, Dan, is this during the summer. If he goes and does work for an hour, he's not going to bill us for that right. job because he's up for eight hours of work. He can bill us at whatever point he wants, but there's eight hours of work we'll be receiving for that one payment of, of, of $2,000. Okay. So, so is the benefit to us that we have him sort of on a retainer? Is, is yes. That the, and, the, yep. and, we've lock, and we've locked in the rates, as Dennis was saying, as a positive. Um, yes, it, it, built a relationship with someone who we know the quality of the work that they do and the responsiveness, right. which is day and age is they're both great qualities. Mm. So go over with me again, how we keep track of what he's doing. That's where I'm a little fuzzy. 
Sure. So the 10 winter days are going to be allocated by us based on the priority of farms that we already put together. So Leadums we knew was five days. Stackhouse right. we knew was five to seven days. Those were the 10 days we guaranteed him. Those are done. Next year, whoever the next two farms are, I think they were probably in yellow because there were only two farms in red. They're done. Next year, when we go to yellow, any time after the crop is picked up, we determine what we're going to do, what our plan of attack is, and we tell Matt. And then okay. he has whatever time he wants during the winter to fulfill those 10 days on those properties. And he'll be in touch with whoever the overseer of those farms are. And a bill will get sent to Dan and those $10,000 will be spent that way. Now, now what are the oh, bamboo? Yep. The bamboo uh, we it? already know is done three times a year. Right. The only one that we have to keep track of, and I'm happy to do it, is when he's working during the summer, we are purchasing eight hours for $2,000. If one job takes two hours and he wants to bill us at the end of that for the $2,000, that's fine. But we still have six hours coming to us. How we use them will be determined by which trees fall or which farms need it. And I'm happy to and, keep track of that. That's, that's and, simple in, in, in my eyes. And Sean, what if we don't have the work? It seems like we have plenty of work, in it, but at some point we won't. What if we don't have the work? We just don't spend the money. Is that it? Is it that simple? No. We, well, no, because we're guaranteeing him 10 winter days and two summer days. Okay. The two summer days equal 16 hours. If I'm thinking the other way, we're going to be purchasing more than two days. But let's say I'm completely wrong and we don't go through 16 hours. Well, then we're going to use those hours for him to cut a buffer area, for instance, which he said is a half day's work, right? He can come cut leadums in a half a day. He can cut uh, stack house right. in a half a day. Oh, we can send him to one of the farms that we have tagged as yellow, and he can get started on that. We're never going to leave hours on the table. To me, the only mm -hmm. thing we're possibly leaving is, are we paying winter rate or summer rate for those hours? Obviously, we want to pay summer rate in the summer and winter in the winter, but we're never going to lose hours. We're still going to get all the same work done. Yeah, that's an important point because he uh, can do maintenance for us even though I don't want to really spoil our farmers and them thinking they don't have to do anything, but they can right. do a, a yearly cleanup and, and for us. And, and, and yeah. Okay. That's exactly right. So we we'll, won't lose this. Yeah. Okay. Well, Sean, I, I think your minimum of 10 day, 10 winter days and two summer days it are, are very, your, your minimums of 10 winter days and two summer days are very safe. I, I agree with you. I, I think, we're not going to, you know, uh, underutilize that. I mean, if anything, we'll be using more time. So I think you've set a, a, a safe threshold. Uh, okay. For those minimums. Okay, great. Well, then I told Matt that I would make contact with him after tonight's meeting mm -hmm. and I will finalize the, the agreement and put it in, in front of you all to read one last time before I look for a signature on it. But all we're ultimately doing is locking ourselves in for three years, locking in the price, we'll pay per job, uh, which makes it easy uh, for both and for our recording and, and go forward that way. Great. Um, do, I think we'd like to have a motion uh, out of this so we can ha have it recorded that we voted on this. So would you ha have a, a motion for what? for Sean to revise the agreement and have Matt review, have us review, and then Matt sign and finalize it. Is that it? How about, yeah. um, I would say a motion to adopt subject to, so that we don't need to vote on this a second time, a motion to adopt this agreement and present a mat for execution subject to the modifications of, um, you know, the billing arrangement, he can bill it um, as he sees fit. And it yes. doesn't need to be monthly or quarterly. Yes. Okay. Do we have a, do we have a second to that motion? Or, or Sean, did you want to revise? No. Okay. Do you have a second? Mm -hmm. Dennis, all in favor, raise your hand, say aye. Aye. 
All in favor. Thank you. Any public comment on that section on parcel issues, Kirk? No public comment. All right. Thank you. So, so we can move on to um, soil conservation efforts uh, on Clearview and Stackhouse. Uh, Dennis, Dan, um, or Sean, I'm sorry, Dennis and Sean. I do have an update myself if you haven't learned anything new. I, guess, I mean, I, I can start on Clearview. Uh, yep. You and I were out there uh, meeting with the machinery operator and the Bucks County Conservation Service, uh, going over the plans of, the, of what they're going to do. In Clearview, there's two terraces in that field that uh, just over many, many years have become ill-shaped and are no longer uh, providing the functionality that they were designed to. So the heavy equipment's going in there. They're going to reshape those two terraces. And in particular, the uh, where the terraces end towards 295, they're bringing in multiple truckloads of, of big, heavy rock to control water runoff as it approaches the 295 uh, steep bank. Uh, and uh, and so that that work is is planned. I, I don't know if they started yet in the last week or two, uh, but I know they'll be starting sometime this month. Was the plan? And actually, they have started. That's the update. I spoke to Tim Stewart earlier this week, and they have started. And John, the um, uh, excavator, was going to get uh, wanted to have Rachel Anuska from Bucks County Conservation come back out and refer, reconfirm that what he was doing was meeting uh, the plan, at least on Stackhouse. And I think he was going to do. Uh, I'm sorry, at least on Clearview. Okay. I don't know. Sean, do you have anything to add on Stackhouse? No, I was under the impression from our visit out there two weeks ago, Mike, is that Stackhouse was going to be first because of the, the job scope. But I have seen the, the bulldozer out on Clearview um, over the past couple of days. So I, I take it that they'll be coming to Stackhouse second. But no, no, no update. It was uh, rather conceptual in conversation at best. And, and that's why that John really wanted uh, uh, the Bucks County Conservation District to come back out and actually see what he started to do. Because as I said, you can hand wave and point over here and point over there, but it's all you know, very theoretical until you actually start digging. Correct. Well, they, were, so, they, were, they were gonna stake, they, they were gonna stake all that off, what we walked at. Is what, she did. Is what the soil conservation folks said. Did they stake the properties off to give him- They that? did. They okay. did, but she, 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 they wanted, he wanted to, to, again, check versus those stakes and have her actually eyeball it. Good. Okay, uh, Kirk, any public comment on soil conservation efforts? No public comment. Thanks, Kirk. Um, okay, the next topic is community day. Now that's coming up quite a while from now. It's Saturday, August 28th. Lower Makefield Township Community Day uh, 2021. Um, Dan and I participated in that uh, a few years ago for uh, farmland preservation. Um, and um, this time we got uh, Tim and Sam Stewart interested and said we would sponsor them to pay us a nominal fee for them to, uh, to participate. They've agreed to do that. And so that's Saturday, August 28th. And the plan, as I see it, is that the Charland Farms would, would set up, which whatever way they want to, and that we have a representative there with our, I have an extra sign, like the ones you see along the, the roads for farmland preservation, and set it up there so that people can see that we're associated with uh, w one of the, the farms and be there to answer questions in case there are any. Um, and just to say, uh, Mike, that we, Farmland Preservation offered to do 
to sponsor the, the table or the booth at that community day for all of our tenants. Uh, we made that same offer to any farmer renting our property. Shoreland took us up on that offer. Thanks for the clarification. That's absolutely right. That's right. We did offer all the farmers. Yes. So um, if anyone will be around then in August, you're welcome to, to come by anytime during the day. I think I will be around, so I'll, I'll be there for at least part of the day. Uh, and we'll look forward to that coming up. And the organizer of that will be sending out uh, more information on that in the coming weeks, I've, I've been told. Yeah. I just want to add a couple comments because yeah. like, I think we did it. I feel like it was three years that we maybe uh, I, I sat there at least two different years in a row, but I feel like it might've been three. Uh -huh. And I, I just want to add, I do not think it's critical that there's a representative from us that is there at their booth during the day. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's critical. I don't think it's, I mean, I'll, I don't think it's necessary. I think we got a sign there. That's great. I don't think it's necessary for somebody to be sitting there. Okay. Dan, I'm going to guess that you did it one year, but it felt like three years. <laughs> <laughs> From that comment. <laughs> Just a guess. It was a long day. I was there. I know we did it two years in a row. <laughs> I know we did it two years in a row. Okay. Yeah. Um, we did, but it, it felt it felt like a lot more than that. <laughs> okay, you're right about that. All right. Um, any comment, Kirk, on the community day? No public comment. Okay, thanks. So I'm going to share my screen. I want to um, mention this. If I can find it. No, no, that's not it. Oh, well, let's see. I have something. Yeah. All right, I'm going to share my screen now. Let's see if I can find it here. Can you see? No, not yet. There you go. I should be able to see. So this is part of a report that was put together in 2007 by the Heritage Conservancy on basically what to do with Patterson Farm. The township had really had, had taken it over um, and then had some of the land uh, set aside and preserved. Uh, and the Heritage Conservatives came along and got together a group. And uh, you can see the Board of Supervisors at the time. Uh, Steve Santasera was that, uh, part, part of that at that time. And uh, of note is the makeup of this Patterson Farm Stakeholders Committee. Two uh, of the members of this uh, uh, committee were from Farmland Preservation, Doug Riblett at the time, and Samuel, Sam Conti, who was then the president, and also um, Tom McGowan and Sa Sandy Guzikowski, who sold her property uh, more, most recently. So this group was put together to kind of come up with, with ideas for what to do with it. There was really no, no real direction given to the group, and they came up with a lot of ideas. Let me take a step back. Why am I even bringing this up with us? We don't, we don't own this property. Uh, but the thing is, we don't manage it. But I see ourselves as not only a group that manages uh, the parcels that are uh, under that that we own as a corporation, but also as a resource for the township, uh, an advisory group. And I think the township uh, looks to us for that input, as they did back in 2007 to several members. But I, I, basically this group kind of flailed around and came up with all these possibilities and, and there was no direction. So I wanted to bring it up with the board uh, for us to think about 
what direction uh, any of you might have for bettering the farm and being a better reflection of what Lower, Make Lower Makefield Township can be in terms of farming. Uh, and one more thing, and this has been brought up because the Board of Supervisors now have talked about, and I don't have an update on this, on setting up an ad hoc committee to look at uh, all, they say all of the historic properties, but Ms. Blundy has made it fair, uh, fairly clear that she'd like to see Satter, Satterwaite House be the first thing that's talked about and not, not waited on not waiting on that to, to take on as an issue. So I turn it over to the rest of the board for your thoughts. Um, I, have a, I, have a, I can start. Yeah, so can. Um, it actually came up at the supervisor's meeting the other night. Um, what's today, thir Thursday? Was that just last Thursday. night? Two nights last ago or something been. like that? Yeah. Um, I think they continued the conversation again and Dan Granier actually had uh, mentioned this same report again during the, the continued conversation. Yeah. Um, and as part of that, uh, I think Dan, I, I forget kind of where they fell out, but I don't think they finalized the complete makeup yet, but I know that Dan had at least commented that, you know, that there should be, you know, different people pulled together, you know, more broad representation to some degree. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I, I just want to be to, to kind of restate, Mike, to kind of complete maybe one of your thoughts, but tell me if, you, if I'm not doing what you said or what you were thinking. Um, I, I think that this, this committee did what they were set out to do and mm -hmm. set forth a nice set of recommendations. Um, they have you know, a lot of conclusions and recommendations that were put forth and ideas, mm -hmm. you know, to be clear, I think they don't, they were not in a position to enforce anything or put through anything. So right. if there's a lack of action that took place after this, I think that sits squarely on the, on the township supervisors. Right. Right. Um, there was a couple interesting things in here, um, you know, talking about long-term or short-term. One, I think very key to us is it was keep the houses separate from the farm, that the houses should be dealt with in a completely separate manner than the farms and the farmland. Um, so that was, I think was interesting. They talked about short-term or long-term lease options uh, Mike, the one thing they talked about was that they felt that this was not suitable for education, whether that is having people actually come out and learn something about farming or, uh -huh. or turning one of the actual buildings into some sort of museum on farming or the like. Hmm. And I kind of like bring back to what you bring it in reverse and say that, yeah, they, they, this committee brought up a number of recommendations and ideas, but they ha had no guidance. I, someone, it seems to me, from the Board of Supervisors say, this is the, or the Board of Supervisors as a whole say, this is the vision we have for this property. Otherwise, it's just going to be another committee that's going to bring up all these ideas and they're going to go nowhere. So it's kind of saying the same thing. You know, if we, if, if a, a new committee generates a bunch of ideas and the board of supervisors doesn't show leadership to drive it in a dir certain direction, then it will go nowhere. And, and that property continues to just lay there decaying. It's just a shame. I, I agree that it's a shame. Uh, it's, it's obviously a key resource or key property to the township. It's, it's the opening picture on Lower Mayfield Township website. Uh, it's, you know, we're, we're talking about uh, this Edgewood Village now being more of a I hate to use the phrase downtown of, of Lower Makefield, but 
you know, with the new development going in and, and Cricket Farm and and Flowers Fields and everything else, you know, this is an important resource that uh, is laying fallow without a doubt. Um, and I, I, for one, quite frankly, if if we're looking for ideas of how to use the buildings and what to do, uh, I, I for one would be interested in maybe joining that committee. I don't know if the farmland board itself can, you know, what the farmland board can do other than, you know, board members maybe taking a, 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 an interest in the committee. But I, for one, have driven by that property in a very static state for 30 years that I've lived here. Uh, I Before I could have ideas, I'd need to tour the place. I need to see what's in that one. Is that an old dairy barn, or is it a is it is it a livestock? You know what 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 is that? I mean, I, I have no idea what those buildings are like. I I have a an image in my mind, but it could be totally wrong. I, I just see the un, unpainted exterior. And it's township property, so you can't really without permission. No, no. I'm, I'm saying right. if, if a committee's formed, they they need to spend some time there and really understand, as you're saying, get some guidance and understand what is there and repairable and what isn't there and, and maybe isn't repairable uh, or salvageable, right? So that would all be part of the process. Mm -hmm. sure. um, Sean, what are your thoughts? Mike, this is one that I, I can't say that I have strong a, a strong opinion on. Um, I guess I tend to think a bit in, in, in black and white. I, I wonder where it is that our, you know, that our board or our role uh, runs a, a, an intersection with this other than points that have already been made by yourself and, and Dennis. So I, I'm, I'm interested in the conversation and I'm listening to the conversation, but it, it's not something that I can say that I have a, a strong opinion on where, where our role lies. Okay, so since some of us, uh, you know, have more of an interest in this than, than others, um, and I was headed to where, Dennis, you were saying, I, I think we ought to offer that we get representation on this committee. And Dan, is that fitting with what the discussion was at the Board of Supervisors? Where, where did they leave it? Well, I, I, um, I don't remember exactly, because um, okay. I think I caught just a piece of it, but not the entirety of it. And I know they were talking about, I think they also had representation here, the Environmental Advisory Council. Right. Um, you mean that, the, old, that, the old one? Yeah, that that same group would also have, you know, some sort of representation. I, I think it might have been still up for but them to finalize how that may work. Uh huh. And, and do you know who who is is it? Suzanne Blundy, who is actually forming the committee, or Dan? Uh, well, I think it's I think Sue appeared to be the one leading it. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So uh, I'm going to make a proposal uh, if if there's no disagreement with this that I contact Suzanne and offer uh, our services that one or more of us would would be happy to serve on, on this ad hoc committee yeah uh the way they were talking about it one they were talking about one you know finding people the right people to be a part of it but also that um somebody had mentioned something about you know having the right set of people but also you having volunteers that become overburdened too and have that many more meetings that they're now going to um, so I think there was some, you know, some level of debate around, you know, having people serve on two different committees or that it is one person or, you know, that there's always a reserved spot for somebody from environmental advisory council or always a reserved spot from somebody from farmland preservation. So I yeah. think there might've been a little bit of debate around on that concept. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Overburdening. Well, as long as the individuals, let's say myself or Dennis, have expressed an interest, and we're uh, not full-time workers at the present, uh, outside of this, 
um, if we would be interested, at least there's two of us. So, uh, Dennis, are you have I, I don't want to put names forth right now, but if it comes to them saying, sure, we'd like uh, one or two members, would you be happy to, to do this, serve on this? I'd, I'd be happy to consider it. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm will yes, I'm willing to. Uh, kind of like our, our first meeting, uh, our first topic. I mean, let's yes, I'd like to find out more about what's involved before I, I commit to it. But yeah, yeah, I'd be interested in, in in weighing in as a an old agriculturalist uh, who's you know been in this area for a long time. Okay. I mean, and Mike, when you say that we're retired, I'm reminded of the meme that says, just because I'm doing do nothing doesn't mean I'm available. <laughs> 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 Got to tell my daughter that, please. <laughs> okay. Uh, in ad hoc. I'm just writing this down now. I don't have to make. Um, any other thoughts on this before we ask for public comment? Okay, hearing none. Kirk, any public comment on Patterson Farm discussion? No public comment. Okay. Uh, other business? Anyone? Um, Mike, just one thing. Um, it wasn't long ago that we went through the responsibilities of farm by board member, but given the recent change in the structure of the board, is it necessary for us to realign those responsibilities? Right. So um, with uh, Don's um, resignation, there's one property that's outstanding, and, that, and that's uh, Bridal Estates. Everything else is covered. So uh, would anybody be willing to pick up bridal estates? I'm looking on my handy map that I printed out of where bridal estates is. It's like, isn't it Lindenhurst and 332 or just back in there somewhere? All right. It's right behind I, Doug Wright's farm. The property is contiguous with the Wright farm. Uh, there's never any issues there. Uh, okay. That, yeah. Right never been an it. issue since I've been on the like board. It's his property and he knows the neighbors and it, it all seems very copacetic. There's not a lot of large trees that come down or anything else. Uh, okay. I got to well, know, uh, spend a little time with, with Doug in signing up the new 2020 leases. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's it's uh it's not a very active issue. Okay. Well, I'm the I'm the newest member and one that loves to get more and more familiar with the properties that we have. So I'm I'm happy to to take on that responsibility unless someone else has an axe. Sean finds the work to be done over there. You better believe it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay. That's great, Sean. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Uh, and, and just recently, although uh, uh, Doug hasn't, Doug Wright hasn't been, and I know Dennis, you've gotten to know, know him and the family. Um, I haven't really talked to him much at all over the 10 years or so that I've been, but I did call him about the USDA survey and he got right back to me and uh, was very cooperative and helpful. Oh, yeah. So Wonderful. that's good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other business? Mm -hmm. I have yes, then, Mike, just a, a quick report uh, on the on the red tag program, the supplemental beer uh, control program. Uh, right. A couple of weeks ago, uh, April 19th, I received uh, from the Game Commission 23 red tags uh, covering four of our properties, Longshore, Leadham, uh, Clearview and Makefield Brook. Those four properties we applied for the red tag. Uh, Sam Stewart is the permittee for that. He actually holds the permits. Uh, if you can see it, this, these are the red tags. It's a heavy plastic tag. Each one is oh, yeah. numbered and uh, uh, it would be a tag, you know, fastened and locked in place. 
uh, with a, on, on, a, on the ear of a, of a harvested deer. Uh, we got 23 of these uh, on December, uh, April 23rd and 24th. I distributed 19 of these 23 uh, to sub permittees, hunters that stand as the permittee as, as given the tag to. They each have one tag uh, across those properties. Uh, and, and I just today sent in the report, the April report to the game commission. They need a report every month on the status of the tags. This month's report was zero harvests. There were no, uh, they've only had the tag of a week or so within the month of April and there were no, no tags used in April. And each month I'll monitor that, um, uh, and, and send in a report to the game commission. Uh, any red tag that is filled by a hunter uh, will replace it with another one. Um, and if we exhaust all the red tags in a, a, a given property, we reapply to the game commission and they, uh, they will probably, they're not obligated, but we expect they would give us more. Uh, so just, just a, a quick update on that. And also, when I said I, I distributed 19 of them, uh, 10 of them were distributed to uh, BOMA, uh, the organization that uh, uh, coordinates the, the deer population control with, uh, with Lower Makefield. Uh, uh, and uh, Jim there, who runs that organization, he has 10 tags which he uh, then distributes to his individual hunters. And last year, if you recall, they were quite successful in, in using those tags. So uh, the season is very short. It's going to expire here May 15th, and then we'll resume July 1st. Uh, May 5th, they took that, that six weeks off, which is the fawning season. Uh, so if uh, they're not used here in the next couple of weeks uh, or a week or so in May, then uh, they won't kick into gear till till July. So that's that's where we stand. And July through to uh, the beginning of the regular um, season. archery season, which is uh, late in September. Well, I don't have any right now. Okay, Dennis, can I ask you a couple? Quick questions. I'm sure they're probably they're yes, no questions, I bet. These tags are to take doe only. Antlerless deer only. Okay. And the hunting is done by bow and arrow? Exclusively. During daylight hours or can be hunted at night with? You know, all of the, uh, it's archery hunting only. Uh, all of the normal hunting regulations apply in terms okay. of hunting hours, sunrise to sunset, in terms of property setbacks, uh, certain distances from residences, permission to be on the land, every hunting regulation that applies in the normal season applies here. Plus, uh, they are obligated to wear blaze orange going in and coming out, uh, which is very atypical, which is not required in archery. Correct. So that's that's a bit of an exception, but other than that, it's every rule that you're probably familiar with. Okay, and the red tag is what allows the harvested deer to be taken to be harvested. Yes. Yeah. And, and each hunter who, who possesses a red tag also needs to have on them the eight and a half by eleven sheet of paper from the game commission. That, that specifies this permit number and has all the signature of the farmer and everything else. So for each property, there's a different permit. And each, when, it, when I gave a, a red tag to each hunter, I give them a copy of that permit, which they have to have folded up and with them in their hunting license or wallet or whatever. Because if a game commission, if a game commissioner stopped them, the game warden, stopped them and said, why are you hunting here? They show the red tag and they show the permit and they're, they're fine. 
Okay. If anyone expresses interest in a different location to hunt, um, Mr. Kaplan expressed great interest in any hunter looking to harvest the deer legally, uh, has the ability to hunt off of his property. He'll give them access. There is a deer stand on the back uh, of the property line. Mm -hmm. uh, I would have to assume it's like shooting fish in a barrel. Literally, they just run through there. But he expressed great interest in having as many deer eliminated as possible. So if anyone's looking for a spot, mm -hmm. uh, you know, please reach out. We have not we have not applied for red tags for the stack house property. Got it. We we we, we could uh, I, I suppose uh, uh, it's late in the game, but I, I, I guess we could uh, if if there's a real interest there. I'll, I'll need uh, that's also Sam. Sam funds. Yes, yeah. yes, that's Sam and Tim. Okay. Yeah, uh, they issue one tag for every five acres of crop land. So I, I'm, I forget the, the tillable acreage in Stackhouse, but mm -hmm. divide that by five, and that's how many tags they will issue. In the past, uh, I recall we didn't do it because of the stewards said they were hunting and their friends were hunting, but don't couldn't they use the red tags as well? Uh, I, I've not talked about hunting on the, with Sam okay. on that stackhouse property. Oh, now to be okay. clear, this is pre-harvest. This is outside of the regular yeah. season. In sure. the regular hunting season, Sam controls who, you know, decides who's on, who's hunting his, his farm okay. properties. We, we don't get involved in that. You're yeah. just involved in the, in the red tag. Yeah. They'd be worth worth revisiting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, um, I can. Uh, uh, does does uh, Mr. Kaplan have hunters? What twenty? Do you know? Or? I I have a feeling, Dennis, that he has a hunter that hunts there during the uh, legal hunting seasons, not during these specialized seasons given the deer stand that's back there. And, and I did ask him if, if someone hunted there and he, and he did say that someone was hunting there, but I would assume that is probably more for harvesting a buck uh, during the buck season than it is for something like this. Well, and, and to be clear, it's, it's particularly challenging hunting outside of the season because when there's no food in those fields, mm -hmm. the deer aren't there. I mean, mm -hmm. they're there when they're, the corn is up and they have some food. A. B, uh, you have to be able to process the deer yourself at home because I don't know of any deer processors that are open outside the, uh, the deer season. No kidding. Like Eli Farm right now isn't open? Nope. No they, kidding. They, they start when archery season starts. Got it. So, mm -hmm. That's a whole the, the network of hunters are, are dedicated hunters who know how and have the equipment to process the venison themselves at home. Okay. That eliminates that, that, that eliminates just the weekend hunter. individuals to a very narrow number. Yeah. Interesting twist, yeah. yeah. Hey Dennis, uh, I recall in the, in the talk about permits and all that you were required to put up signs identifying yourself. Uh, Is that We've not done that this year. We did it last year for the first time. And uh -huh. it's unclear, it's now unclear to us if that's necessary. Uh, uh, okay. That request came sort of out of left field by uh, the new game warden that would, was responsible for this game management area uh, uh -huh. last year. Uh, that game warden has moved on and uh, there's a new game warden and nothing's been said. And so that's fine we, with you, we, I think, we, right? Right now we're just standing pat on that. Okay. 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 Fair enough. Fair enough. Good. Um, any other, uh, thanks for that update. Thanks, Sean. And thanks, uh, Dennis, for both updates. Any other business that we should go over? No? Uh, 
Kirk, any public comment? Any other uh, business from the public? No public comment. Okay, thanks. So let's uh, review action items and then wrap things up. So the first thing is for me to let uh, James know uh, that and, and, and also get his advice on approaching the township manager. Maybe that's the more appropriate person that we'd appreciate speaking slash interviewing prospective board members in advance. Let him know that's our desire uh, as new, new members uh, come along, hopefully. Uh, then I have uh, Sean. You're going to contact Jim Majewski of Lower Makefield Township about the, the driveway to be put in uh, for the bean farm and, and the uh, three issues, stormwater runoff, the property line, and, the, and maintaining the uh, buffer area, farming buffer area. Sean, I wish you have you down for contacting Matt Corcoran to revise the Corcoran, Corcoran Agreement. I know there's several other steps involved there, but that's a general one. Do you want to re revise that? Uh, okay I'm okay with that. Yeah, okay, we'll leave with that. Uh, I'm, I'm going to let Suzanne Blundy know that uh, farmland preservation, at least some members of, of the board, uh, would theoretically participate you like to participate in the ad hoc committee, depending on you know what's involved, and that, that Dennis, that includes me too. I don't want to give a blanket, you know, just yes uh, until I, I would know what's involved as well. Um, as a board, we reassign uh, Bridal Estates to Sean, and thanks Sean for taking that on. Mm -hmm. And anything else? What did what did I miss? No? Okay. Well, if that's it, then I would uh, make a motion to adjourn for the evening. I will second. Have a second. It. Okay, all in favor. All right, so we are so adjourned. Thanks, everyone. And thank you to, to the public or those who view this af afterwards. Have a, have a nice